My name is Michelle Steele, and I'd like to take a few minutes and talk to you about the bad decisions that I've made in my life. I spent much of my early life as an addict up until the time that I was 23 years old, from the time that I ran away from home at 15 years old till the age of 23, I was in a lifestyle of addiction and crime. I almost went to prison for 10 years for three counts of attempted armed robbery. I died of drug overdoses, some that were... Um, Attempts at suicide, where I took an entire bottle of pills. That didn't just happen once, that happened twice. There were two times that I literally died with my heart stopping and them having to do CPR to bring me back to life because of the cocaine overdoses. The first time that I died, I'd been doing cocaine for days upon end. We had an unending supply at that time, and we would just go get more, and and we were just, because we weren't eating and we weren't sleeping, we were just doing cocaine. We needed to put more in the syringe to be able to feel it, and then the person who was doing the cocaine with me, he forgot what he was doing, and he gave me two doses, his dose and my dose at the same time, and my heart stopped. And when my heart stopped, um, I fell back on the bed and my eyes rolled back and I, I then stopped breathing. There was another person in the room who grabbed all their drugs and ran out the door. And the person, my first husband, who had given me his shot and my shot, he didn't know how to do CPR, but he did know that my heart needed to start beating again. So he drugged me into the shower and he turned the cold water on and he began to take his fist and beat me in the chest until my heart began to beat again and I began to breathe. And it took an hour before I could speak. It took an hour before I could answer any questions. I remember I was soaking wet and I was laying there on the hotel bed in my clothes, soaking wet. And he kept asking me to tell me, tell him my name or his name or what year it was, or who I was. He kept asking me these questions. And when I finally could speak, the only thing I, the very first thing I asked for, the only thing that was on my mind is, do we have any cocaine left? That's how deep in addiction I was. And I have to admit, I did not start the crime, the prostitution, the stealing, I didn't start those things to meet my addiction need. I actually did it differently. I began turning to drugs to deal with what I was doing. I remember making the statement, I will never be sober another day in my life. I was so ashamed of the life that I was living, the mistakes that I had made. I ran away from home. When I was 15 years old, I burnt all the bridges with my family. My family couldn't trust me. My family didn't talk to me. I didn't have relationships with them. At one point when I had tried to reestablish a relationship with my mother and I I'd let her help me take care of my child because I was in addiction. She began raising my child and then they made me take my child away from her and that ruined that relationship again. There were so many things in that addiction because of the, the, the addiction was the way out of the the mistakes I had made. I could forget about my shame. I could forget about my pain. I could I could, like that proverbial song is, just a little pinprick. Yeah, I knew if I could get another shot, I wouldn't have to look in the mirror. I wouldn't have to deal with who I was. I wouldn't have to think about who I had wronged. I wouldn't think have to think about all of the degrading humiliation of sleeping with men for money, 
of sleeping with men old enough to be my grandfather, climbing in and out of, of trucks selling my body, climbing in and out of hotels selling my body. I didn't have to deal with it if I could get high. And so I became an addict to deal with the decisions that I was making. You know, when I'd ran away from home, the guy that I ended up with who we later married, but the whole time I was married to him, he was my pimp. So it wasn't marriage like people would think of today. It wasn't marriage where I was trusting in my husband and that we shared a life of love. It was a very different situation. And so he was my pimp. And that marriage was convenience because what he would say to me is what you have is mine and what I have is mine. You know, most people would say what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine, but not in his book. What's yours is mine and what's mine is mine. And that was the, the scenario that I was in, but I was so addicted to him. I, that part of the reason I started doing the things that I was doing was to try to get him to love me, try to get him to, to be mine. And that never quite worked. And it was from the time that I ran away at 15 years old until the time that I was 23, that he and I both lived this life of crime, this life of addiction. And during this time, uh, we had, uh, children. And as I said, other family members were raising those children that added to my guilt, that added to my humiliation, that added to my failures. And, and so by the time that we were facing the possibility of prison time, because we had went on a crime spree, which we, uh, in that crime spree, he robbed three gas stations or one of them he attempted to rob. He did rob two of them. So we were facing, I was being charged with attempted armed robbery because I was with him in the car and he was being charged with the robberies. By that time, I was so involved. I, I was so under the control of the addiction that I couldn't stop it it did have a hold on my life and i help people now who have been in addiction and one of the things that i can identify is that in the beginning when we started when we began those decisions when we began choosing to go get high and choosing to submit ourselves to that drug we thought we were in control and we thought we we're making the decision, but at some point, that drug and the, the force of the enemy, the force of Satan behind that drug, he energizes that addiction until it becomes something that we no longer have the choice to say, I don't want to do it. Because I did come to that point where I didn't want to do it, but I couldn't stop. And I want, I want to just share some, some thoughts that held me in addiction. And I just want you, if you're facing something like that, maybe it's not a drug addiction, maybe it's an alcohol addiction or a food addiction, or maybe you're in a lifestyle. And, and some of these thoughts might identify for something that you've thought as well. But these are thoughts that held me in addiction. The, one of them was, there's no exit from the fast lane. There was a song that was really popular during this time, a Southern rock song, it was a uh, life in the fast lane. And this, this song was, was a description really of addiction. When you get over in that fast lane, there's no exit off the fast lane. Surely it'll make you lose your mind, right? That, that fast lane in those major metropolitan cities, there's not a lot of exits off that fast lane. If you're in there, you better know when you get on that fast lane where you're going to get off. Well, in addiction, you get in there thinking it's fun, and then you realize there's no exit. It's like the Hotel California song, which was also an addiction song. There's You can check in, but you can never leave. And that was where I found myself. I didn't think there was an exit out of the life that I was living I thought my life was beyond repair anyway, because by the time I'd come to this point, I was homeless. I'd lost. I didn't have money. I didn't have a car to go to a job to get any money. 
I had ruined all my family relationships. I couldn't borrow any money. I had warrants. I had warrants for my arrest. I had lost my driver's license, so I couldn't drive a car even though I didn't have a vehicle anyway to go to work. I couldn't have driven it legally because I'd lost my driver's license. If they pulled me over, I'm going to jail. There was so many things stacked against me that it made me want to just give up anyway. I thought, my life is wasted. It's beyond repair. And, you know, at, at the the lowest point, at, we were facing being uh, uh, charged with a time in prison But the day after we were charged with it, my husband died. He died of a drug overdose. And in that, what I thought was already a life out of control, when he died, my life really went out of control because he had been the one telling, even though it was a controlling manipulation, he was the one who told me what to do. And then he died and I didn't know what to do except keep doing what I'd been doing, which was getting high. So it was really the lowest point. But I thought my life is so far beyond repair that I don't know how to even fix it. I didn't even know where to start fixing it. Another thing that held me in that place of addiction was I had been getting high to avoid the things I had done, and to avoid the shame. And if I stopped getting high, I had to sober up and think about my life. And that was unbearable. That was painful. That There was no solution in it. It was just, it was such a, a humiliation and shame. It was just easier to stay high and not have to deal with my mistakes. So I thought, that was my thought. And I didn't know any other way of living. I had lived that lifestyle for for all those years. I did not know any other way of living. Now remember, I was 15 when I ran away from home. I didn't really have a good foundation of life, even at that point, because My parents had divorced. I went and lived here. Then we came back and I lived here. And so there wasn't any of a safe place that I felt I could return to. And I didn't know any other lifestyle other than that life of crime. And that I hadn't worked a real job since I was 15. And I didn't work very long when I was 15 until I got my first paycheck and ran away with it. So I didn't know how to work a real job. I didn't know how to grocery shop. A life of an addict is you go in and you get food for the moment. We, I didn't buy food for a week. I didn't know how to buy food for a week. Pay a bill? Are you kidding me? I had never paid my bills on time. That's why we got evicted from every place we ever did live. And then we ended up living in hotels and week-to-week rentals and, and trailers that you would rent that already had the utilities in, 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 included in the rent. I had never paid bills. So I didn't know how to live a responsible life where I kept a job and paid my bills and actually put money in the bank. If money would come into my hand, it went out of my hands as quick as it went in. So I didn't know how to live. All of my friends were party friends. I didn't know other people. Remember, I'd lost relationship with responsible people because they couldn't let me into their life because I was dangerous to have in their life. And, and the family that we did have around really kept us at a arm's length because we were thieves, we were addicts, and, and we were untrustworthy. So I did not know any other lifestyle. The places I went were drug places. I didn't know where else to go. The people I hung out with. And so those were things that held me in this place of staying in this addiction. And I'll tell you another one that I found out maybe after I was I was rescued from that lifestyle. I didn't recognize it at the time, but I can look back and I can see it. I felt like I deserved the life I was living. It was a way of self-punishment. I didn't deserve better. I'd never been a good daughter. I'd never been a good mother. 
I'd never been a good wife. I'd never been a good anything. I had been a liar. I had been a thief. I had been one who would steal from you. I had been one who took her kid's money and got high on it. I I deserved what I was getting. And in a way, it seemed like it was self-punishment. And then I didn't think about this one until there at the very end of that life of addiction. It was this. Someone had invited my my first husband, the one who passed away, before he passed away, just days before he passed away, his grandmother made him promise he would come to church. And he went to church with her, and he wanted me to go with him. And that was the first time since I had lived with my grandparents that anybody had thought about inviting me to church. I'd had... I'd had some times when I was in fifth grade, maybe where I went with some friends from school, but it was youth group and and it was fun. It was singing. It was just, you know, interacting with the youth. It wasn't really thinking about God. And so when he invited me to go to church with him, where his grandmother, which was where my children went to church, I said something I didn't even knew I thought until he confronted me and tried to coerce me into going to church. I said, I don't need God. But what I thought was, God hates me. I was trying to act tough. I don't need God. You go if you think you need God. I'd gotten a little bit of attitude by then, even though he would beat me, even though if I back talked him, he would slap me down. I was, and by this time, I had, I was hard hearted and I, it came out of my mouth. I don't need God, but what I really thought was God hates me. And I thought to myself, how could I walk in the church? <laughs> how could I enter in to the church? There's going to be a lightning strike, and it's going to hit me. The walls are going to fall on me. God doesn't want me in his church. And I realized that I thought God hated me. What else? That's why I never turned to God. That's why I didn't go to him for help. I thought God hated me. I was convinced of it until I was in the ICU unit. They were keeping my husband's body alive. He was brain dead, and his brain was swelling. Through the sides of his head, you could see the brain swelling. And we were preparing to take him off the machines. And this man from church who had prayed with him the day before wanted to take me to the chapel and pray with me. I'd been getting high in the hospital. My friends were bringing me drugs in the hospital. I was shooting up Dilaudid. I was shooting up cocaine in the hospital. I didn't want to talk to this preacher. I was in the worst condition of my life. And the answer of God comes and I'm thinking to myself, I want to get rid of this guy. I want him to quit talking to me. And so when he would ask me questions, I would be like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, okay, right, uh uh-huh. And I was so rude, and he didn't care how rude I was. He wasn't there to make me like him. He was there to to make me think. And he would ask me questions in a way that made me answer that yes and no wasn't an appropriate answer. I couldn't get away with, yeah, uh uh-huh, whatever. I had to think about what he was asking me, and I had to answer him in a sentence. And... He was talking to me about Jesus in a way that made it personal. He said, Jesus Christ died on the cross. I'm like, yeah, uh uh-huh, right. I heard that before. And he said, no, no, he died for you. He knows the mess that you're in today. And he died to help you out of the mess you're in today. And it was an eye-opener for me. I'd never believed that before. And I, with one little tiny glimmer, it wasn't a full-blown understanding. 
It wasn't a, a an awakening with this brilliant light of, wow, God loves me. This is what I thought. If God wants to help me, I really do need his help. I don't have any other help available. And if God would help me, I need his help. And I prayed with that man a prayer that opened up the door for God to start working in my life. I asked him to help me. We took the machines off of Bo's body and he passed. I was such a mess at the funeral, they almost kicked me out of his funeral. I was high. I don't remember where I was the night of his funeral after. I don't remember who told my kids their dad died. It was a few weeks later that I died the second time from the cocaine overdose. I had asked God to help me, but I didn't know where to find his help. And I went back to the life that I knew, the only thing I knew in my ignorance and my lack of knowledge. And I ended up staying with this guy who owned a bar. And he was a cocaine supplier. And I sat in the back of that bar in the projects of East Nashville. And I shot cocaine day and night and night and day. And because I couldn't feel it, I hadn't been eating, I hadn't been sleeping. All I'd been doing for three long days was getting high. And I said, can you put more in there? Because I can't feel it anymore. That should have been a, 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 a signal. But he did. He put more in, in there, and I pulled it up in the syringe. And I put the whole thing in my arm. But before I could even pull the syringe or untie my arm, pull the syringe out or untie my arm, I quit breathing and I fell on the floor dead. But I left my body and I stood in front of a skull. It wasn't a skeleton. It was a skull. And these hands began to reach for me. It was as if darkness had hands. I was more afraid than I'd ever been in my life. It was real fear. Because in that split moment, that split second, I knew hell is real. I don't want to go there. And as those hands were reaching for me, trying to pull me into death, I ran back to my body with all my power, with all my might. I ran and I ran into my body. And when, when I hit my body, this man who was doing CPR on me is suddenly fighting me because I began to swing and to kick. And because in, in my perception, those hands are still trying to pull me into death. And he finally lets me up and I jump up and I keep running and I run for a few blocks in the rain through the projects trying to escape death. It was a Sunday morning that I overdosed and I went to church that night. And I don't think the church knew what to do with me. They, I waited I didn't know how to pray the prayer of salvation. I didn't know how to ask Jesus into my heart. I had prayed for God to help me. I would kind of prayed that prayer that that man told me to repeat after him. And all that I had faith for is help me, God. And now here I am. I'm coming back to that same place where this was where that man had been sent from, the church he had been sent from. I'm there in their church. And they prayed for me. But they didn't quite know what to do with me. They just prayed, oh, God bless her, help her, you know, and, and kind of sent me out. I didn't, I didn't find my answer. How, well, how do I do this, God? So I thought, I 
am going to clean myself up. And I went to a drug rehab to try to get off the Dilaudid that I was on. It was the part that was physically addictive. And so they put me on methadone, and I totaled three cars. And I don't know where I left those cars to this day. I totaled three cars. One of them I did hear that I, I was told that I left it in somebody's front porch. I drove into their front yard and up onto their porch, crashed into their house, and walked away. God ended up sending that same preacher and his wife who found me and took me to church service. And in that church service, I yielded my life to Jesus Christ. I accepted Christ. And when I did, when that, that preacher prayed for me, in a moment, I was free. Instantly, it was August 10th of 1992. And I was set free from that addiction. For the first time in my life, I was sober and in my right mind. I'd never been in my right mind since I was a kid. Never able to think straight, never free from that shame, free, free from that pain. For the first time I could think right. And from that day to this, God's brought me a long way. Now I want to tell you something. Everything still looked hopeless. I was living in a car. The car did not have a title because it was a stolen car. I did not steal the car, but I bought this stolen car, not realizing it. I had nowhere to go, nobody to turn to. I was just trying to put my life back together. Everything was still as hopeless as it was before, but now I had God helping me. And I just started depending on him. And step by step, little by little, God restored my life. I was able to get a secure legal job. I was able to get a home. And in doing so, I was able to regain custody that I had lost of my children. I had my children back. I had a job. I had a little apartment. And a year later, God brought the man of my dreams who loves me like Christ loves the church into my life. And, and we married. And today we serve God all around the world through preaching the gospel, through television. And if you had come to me when I stood on this street corner selling my body for $20 and told me, one day you're going to be on national television preaching the gospel, I would have laughed you off the street that I was selling my body on. But today, God has rebuilt my life, and I'm not who I used to be, and I'm not what I did. And I want to tell you, no matter how hopeless it may seem, no matter how wrong of decisions you may have made in the past, no matter how far down that road you've gone and you think there's no exit, there is an exit off the fast lane. There is an exit out of that hopelessness. There is a rescue for what you're going through, and his name is Jesus. And if you'll call on his name, you don't even have to understand fully everything if you'll just say, Jesus, help me. Like I did, he'll start helping you. But I do want to tell you this, so that you can at least be a little bit further along than I was and miss some of that near-death experience that I had to encounter because of my lack of knowledge. When Jesus died on the cross, he died the death that you deserve. He died in your place. And his blood will cleanse you from every sin that you've ever done, every mistake you've ever made, every failure, every error in your life. Jesus can wipe away all record 
of your wrongdoing. And if you will accept him as Lord and begin to submit to him, he will put your life back together and it will be a life that's better than anything you could dream. You might think you know what's best for your life, but the one who created you knows what he put in you, and he knows how to make your life worth living. So I want to challenge you today. Accept Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made. You don't have to know everything, but just believe that Jesus died for you and God raised him from the dead. Say this with me. I believe that when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he died the death I deserve. His blood cleanses me because today I accept Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior. I believe God Raise Jesus from the dead. I ask you to lead me into the life that you have for me. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, confess with your mouth, it's in Romans 10, you shall be saved. Now, from this moment on, there are two vital things for you to come into this place of restoration that I found myself in. Number one, you need a Bible. The Word of God is the spiritual nutrition. You say, I don't understand how to read that Bible. You will understand more now than you did before because you have accepted Jesus as Lord. You need a Bible. Because the Bible helps you to understand the plan of God for your life and feeds you the spiritual strength that you need to be able to walk in the victory that belongs to you. And number two, you need a local church. Jesus is the head of the church, and he designed the local church to be the place where people grow. So ask God to lead you to a healthy local church that believes the Bible. I thank you for taking the time to listen to me today. It has been such a thrill for me to get to share with you the bad decisions that I made and the right decision that changed them all. Thanks for tuning in.